The obvious thing to do once you have a rule is apply it to a hypergraph and see what happens. Have you experimented with applying, say, two different rules to a hypergraph and see how they interact? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's one way that you can start to get very non-trivial multi-way structure. So the multi-way systems we've talked about so far have been multi-way systems where the branchings are because you've got one rule, but it can be applied in multiple places or something, or multiple different ways. But you can also get multi-way systems where some of the branching, at least, is because there are multiple rules that you could apply. Yeah. And this gives rise to these things called rule or multi-way systems, which actually we, Xerxes and I, along with Hatta and Osraploi, did some fairly systematic kind of mathematical investigation of over the last couple of years. So with rule or multi-way systems, the idea is, yeah, you, you start by just adding more and more hypergraphic writing rules. And in particular, eventually you could exhaust all the hypergraphic writing rules of a given signature, right? So you can imagine applying all possible hypergraphic writing rules with signature 23 goes to 23 or something, where yeah. you've got two hyperedges of arity 3 going to two hyperedges of arity 3. And that gives you this thing called a rule or multi-way system. And we investigated this because it turns out that these rule or multi-way systems have a very, at least if you construct them in a certain way, have a very elegant, rich mathematical structure. They have the structure of what's called an infinity category or an infinity groupoid. And then there's a, a sort of classifying space of these rule or multi-way systems, which I think is really what the rule ad is, although with a different name. Yeah. That has the structure of what's called an infinity one topos. And then the really cool thing about that which was really Xerxes' idea, is that then there's a sort of very nice, elegant mathematical argument by which you can talk about how essentially spatial structure gets inherited down to these lower order multiway systems from this infinity category structure by means of this thing called Grothendieck's hypothesis, which it's a very it's a very abstruse mathematical argument. I'm happy to talk about it if you're interested, but it's maybe not worth diverting the conversation in that direction just yet. Yeah, it's probably a little bit beyond me, those kind of mathematical details, but it's one of these things that certainly grabs people's mind, the idea of a Rudyard and the idea of all possible rules, but how fruitful that will be in actually generating provable physics. It's another question. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, the point is, it's like, I think it's a lesson that one can learn from algorithmic complexity theory or algorithmic information theory, right? This idea that it's useful to talk about the complexity of a model or the complexity of a, of a structure in terms of the minimum amount of information or the minimum size of algorithm that you would need to express it unambiguously. So the, you know, the, the example that's often used in Kolmogorov complexity that illustrates how counterintuitive these things are is you ask someone, you know, what's, what's simpler, a single integer or the set of all integers? <laughs> and, you know, intuitively you get, well, obviously it's a single integer because it's way smaller yeah. than the set of all integers. But actually the vast majority of integers are way more complicated than the set of all possible integers because you can write down a simple algorithm or a simple rule or a simple mathematical expression or something that unambiguously defines the set of all possible integers. But a yeah. single integer could require an arbitrarily large amount of information to express. Yeah. And so from a Kolmogorov complexity standpoint or an algorithmic information complexity standpoint, most integers are more complicated than the set of all possible integers. Yes. So one place where I know this has been used is an argument for in favor of the multiverse, right? That you say, well, yeah. you, can ex- you can make the same argument. What's simpler as an ontology? That just our universe exists or that the space of all possible universes exists. And you can make the same yeah. argument to, to reason that it's more plausible that the space of all possible universes exists. So I kind of feel the same way about this kind of Rouliad idea that it's like, well, yeah, okay, in some sense, it's a very, just as the bottom up view is very minimal, the Rouliad view is also very minimal, right? Because it requires basically almost no information to express unambiguously what it is. But precisely because of that, I think we believe that Sorry, this is now getting very metaphysical, but like, (laughs) we believe that there is some content to the universe, or at least I I believe that there is some content to the universe, that that it's not all just a tautology, that, you know, to to uniquely express our universe requires some non-trivial amount of information. Yes. And so for that reason, I don't think either a pure bottom-up or a pure top-down approach are going to be enough, right? You need something that's kind of, you need that plus some other bit of data. You need something. You yeah. need either a rule that specifies how things get restricted or a rule that specifies how things get built up. I agree. It's a, it's a very good way of kind of capturing people's attention, thinking about all possible yeah. rules or all possible structures or all possible universes or something. But you have to impose on top of that something else in order to be able to get anything that's kind of non-trivial. Why do you have that intuition? It's, it's always very difficult to explain an intuition, but what, why do you have the intuition that the universe is not a tautology, that there is some information required to define our universe? Okay, that's a... Uh, yeah. So I, I, I should be very clear. This is, you know, I'm, I'm just, this is just me speculating about some yes. you know, bizarre... Like, I, don't, I, can't, I can't prove any of this, right? But yeah, let me give two levels of explanation there. So the first thing is that I think 
if we look at what we know about the laws of physics, there are lots of things in there that, that are very kind of minimal and elegant, like, you know, um, the Einstein field equations, for instance. Yeah. You take the, essentially, the, 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 the simplest curvature invariant that you can define, and then you make the simplest constraint on that curvature invariant, and that gives you the Einstein field equations. And somehow, that, that, remarkably, that's sufficient to like, encode all of gravity. That's amazing. Yeah. So there are certainly some things where it seems like the, the universe is very minimal and very structureless in that way. But then there are other places like, you know, for instance, the particle content of the universe, where I think it's safe to say the same is not true. And, you know, yeah. maybe someone will say, okay, but the fact that there's, you know, there's this hierarchy of particles and the fact that we have all these different fundamental forces is because of some broken symmetry or whatever. And that may end up being true. But it certainly seems to be the case that, and this is something which, you know, actually, I think theologians, people like John Dunn Scotus and other scholastics first talked about this in a serious way that the world seems to be neither completely trivial, right? It's n n neither fully reducible, where right? everything is, is ordered and, 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 and minimal, but it's neither completely irreducible, right? It's, 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 not, it's not that everything is chaotic and we can't make any kind of general statements. It's somehow it seems to lie somewhere in this liminal space in between, where there's enough content that it's interesting, but not so much content that we can't write down well-defined laws yeah. of science or laws of nature. And so I'm, I don't know. I, so I suppose I, I, in terms of justification for my own metaphysical viewpoint, I defer to the scholastics. Yeah. That at least accords with my experience of reality. Yeah. That the universe is not completely trivial, but it's also not maximally complicated. Then I think another level of explanation, which is worth bringing up at this point, because we haven't really discussed it yet, is, is the interplay between observers and the universe, right? So yeah. with any of these situations, there's, there's a question of, there's an important philosophical question, which I think doesn't get talked about in the philosophy of science enough, which is essentially the question of where you place the computational burden, right? Because one way that you can think about this dichotomy between the bottom-up picture and the top-down picture is that it's a distinction in whether you place the computational burden entirely on the universe or whether you place the computational burden entirely on the observer. What I mean by that is, in a bottom-up view, if you want to say, okay, we, we want some rule that generates you know, physics as we observe it, then basically what you're saying is the observer, you're not even caring about the observer. There's no model of the observer here. You just say, you know, we, we have notions like particles and fields and curvature and whatever, and we want a rule that reproduces those, those phenomena. Okay, so the observer is irrelevant, and you're placing all of the computational burden on the universe to reproduce that phenomena. That's the kind of extreme bottom-up view. The other extreme is you say, well, actually, the universe is trivial. That, you know, it's just a rouliad or something. You know, all possible structures are instantiated. And everything that we perceive, like curvature or fields or particle content, is some feature of us and the way that we perceive reality. It's some feature of how we slice apart the rouliad. And so then you're, you're saying, well, now the computation for the universe is trivial. All the computational burden is being placed on the observer. And that's the kind of extreme top-down view. And so all of physics is a byproduct of how we perceive reality, not a byproduct of reality yes. as it actually is, so to speak. Yes. And again, I don't think it's meaningful to say that one of these is true and one of these is false. It's that they're equivalent ways of viewing the same thing. You know, yes. All we really know are the things we can observe and we can parameterize it however we like. And so, again, the best way I can summarize my own philosophical prejudice is that the most fruitful way of thinking about the nature of reality is to suppose that it's somewhere in between, that it's neither the case that the observer is completely unimportant and trivial, but it's also neither the case that the universe is completely unimportant and trivial. It's that both take some kind of share of the computational burden, and that therefore the laws of physics are partially a byproduct of you know, reality as it really is, so to speak, whatever that means, and partially a byproduct of how we as observers make sense of the qualia that we experience. But precisely how, you know, what that balance is, I don't claim to know that. Thanks for listening to The Last Theory. Join me for fresh insights into Wolfram Physics every other week. Subscribe to the free newsletter, podcast or YouTube channel at lasttheory.com. After all, this might be the most fundamental scientific breakthrough of our time.